vegetation and can uh, conserve the species. Uh, so basically, if a species is going to go extinct sometime in the future, we not only want to know that it will go extinct, but we want to know it ahead of time. Um, so that we can take conservation action and the species doesn't go extinct. So we want a warning time that is long. Warning time is the time from uh, when the species is listed as threatened or in, a, in one way or the other we know that the species is in trouble to the time that it would go extinct if there is no conservation. Right? And we want this time to be long. Specifically, we want this time to be longer than the sum of latency time and, and response time. Latency time or lag time is the time it takes uh, uh, for the conservation to begin. From the time that we know that the species is in trouble to the time that conservation organizations actually start doing something about it. And response time is the time from when the conservation begins to the time when the species starts recovering. And this has to do with obviously the species biology, generation time, and this has to do more with social and economic factors. So, uh, the, the question that, that we want to ask is not only whether the system predicts the species uh, that will go extinct correctly, but it can, can do it with sufficient warning time. So it's the predictability of these species interaction that I want to talk about first, and I'll give um, uh, results from uh, some of our recent uh, work on this topic. Uh, so, to answer this question, uh, first, we started by modeling uh, species responses to climate change. Now, why climate change? The reason we focus on climate change is that it's a new threat. And um, we didn't really know much about climate change at the time the IUCN Vegas criteria were developed. Uh, they were built in the 1990s, and we didn't know much about, well, actually, we, don't, we still don't know much about species response to climate change. So we said we have to uh, see if the criteria work on the climate change. So, um, we developed these models. So, the, the, the way we model uh, species uh, responses to climate change is that we start with species distribution models, or they are also called ecological niche models. And what it is, is a statistical description of the um, uh, species occurrence locations as a function of climatic factors. So we put this, we call the habitat model or a species distribution model or an ecological niche model. It gives us the current distribution of the species. We can test it because it's giving the, the distribution correctly. And then we assume that this model remains the same, uh, which technically is called niche conservatism. And then we apply the uh, projected climate to that to get the future distribution. Right? Uh, now, we, in our models, we did this. But we did it um, in a slightly different way. We did it for every year. So we have this time series of the potential habitat for the species changing through time. Right? Uh, and then to this, we added uh, information about the demography of the species. So, um, so we can uh, develop these metapopulation models. And what I mean by demography is things like uh, the, the age structure of the population, fluctuations, in these parameters of survival and fecundity, density dependence, dispersal as a function of distance. And then using all of this, we run these simulations and we calculate various things. For instance, extinction risk is calculated as the proportion of these random replicates that reach uh, the point of zero. And then in addition to that, with these models, we can calculate a number of other, other results. Uh, now, the reason we do all of this, go to this trouble of adding demography on top of these ecological niche models, is the difficulty of inferring population responses based on the under range sheets. And uh, here's an example of uh, one of our early applications of this approach to uh, a set of plants in South Africa. You see that the distribution from 2000 to 2050 uh, is changing because of climate change. Um, but the, the distribution is getting wider, the total area that the, of habitat that's suitable is equal or a bit larger perhaps, but it's also getting fragmented. So um, the species may or may not be able to disperse to these suitable areas that, that become suitable as a, as a result of climate change. 
And if they, if it can disperse, then there might be, because of increased fragmentation, there might be higher rates of local extinction in these populations due to things like uh, demographic stochastic scan or the effects. So because of all of these factors, we need to add, um, not, we have to look at not just the climate suitability changing through time, but also the demography of the species. So um, I won't go into the details much, but basically the type of models uh, we do result in um, projections like this. So at the top, you see the habitat su suitability for this particular snake changing uh, through time. As you can see, the uh, suitability is shifting north and um, you know, less and less of the area is, is, is remaining suitable. Uh, now, based on this, we uh, do the uh, demographic uh, data to, to model. Uh, the problem is that the species currently is restricted to this area here. And this is not, this um, resolution is not too good, but you can see that there are these populations here um, um, remaining fluctuating, going in and out of focus. And um, after a while, um, the populations go extinct because there is no um, suitable area left here. And the habitat exists here, but the species cannot disperse. And this is just one example. Uh, we developed um, about 10,000 such models. I won't go into the details of how uh, we did that, but I'm happy to, to discuss the details uh, afterwards, if you like. Uh, so what we did then with all of these simulations is we looked at um, extinction risk at the end and, and, and ask the questions, what factors contribute to extinction risk due to climate change? In other words, this is our response variable, extinction risk in the year 2100, and we are asking whether the, the information we had at the beginning of the simulation, such as the trend, the population size, the area, etc., can explain the extinction risk that we observe at the end. And, and the result is, um, this is one of the results, and there are a few things to note here. So these are the variables that are measured at the beginning of the simulation, and how uh, important they are in predicting the extinction risk at the end of the simulation. And what we see, well, first of all, what we see is that there is very high cross validation, which means that there is high predictability, so the, the, these variables can predict the uh, uh, extinction risk. And um, the variables, um, in the, the top variables include occupied area, population size, spatial correlation, and generation rate. So, um, so that's kind of good news in the sense that, that there is some predictability. Then we notice that these, uh, all of these variables are, are related to the um, factors that are considered in the IUCN Redis criteria. So we decided to do a more direct test of this, um, of this criteria. So what we did is that we took all these simulations, but we took only the ones that went extinct at some point before 2100, right? And then we made an annual radius assessment of each of these trajectories. For instance, uh, suppose that there is one simulation that's doing this, so if each year we look at the rate of decline until that year, and we look at the population size, we look at the occupied area, and we put these into the IOCN the system, and we say at this point in time, this species would have been classified as, let's say, one. Okay? And, and here's one example. Now we have tens of thousands of these, but one, one example is this the species such as least concern, and it's listed as near threatened, and goes up and down and then finally it's listed as critically endangered and then goes extinct. So what we are measuring here is the length of time the species remains in uh, any one of the threatened categories but continuously. Right? So the, 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 the contiguous um, length of time that the species is classified as a, as a threatened species. And we call that number the warning time. That's because that's the time that will be available for conservation actions because the, the system has identified it as a threatened species so that um, they, um, uh, the, the, the conservation organizations know that that species has a risk of going extinct. So in this particular example, for instance, since the species goes to near threatened here, below the threatened level, 
Uh, the length of time is this. This is the morning time that we are talking about. It. So we did this for tens of thousands of different simulations, and here is the, some of the results. Uh, what we see here is the distribution of these times, the number of years that for which the species is listed as a threatened species before it goes extinct. And the good news is that the, um, the, the median time is over 60 years, and very small proportion of these uh, species um, were listed for less than 20 years before they went extinct. So that means that the system gives us sufficient warning time. But there are some caveats. Um, so here is, um, we decided we changed our definition of the warning time. We said this is the, this is the same as the previous. Um, this is the same as the previous, graph, 60 years. Now we said, what if the warning time starts when the species is listed as endangered rather than vulnerable? In other words, if we wait, we don't, we don't take action at the first sign of trouble, but we wait until the species is listed at a higher threat category. Now, if we wait until the species is listed as critically endangered, then it doesn't seem to be sufficient time. The median, time, the, uh, median warning time is only about 20 years, meaning that for half of the species, there will be fewer than 20 years, a shorter period than 20 years, to take conservation action, which may not be sufficient. So that's the first caveat, that uh, if we wait for species to be listed at the highest threat category before taking action, it might be too late. And second caveat uh, has to do with uh, uncertainty and lack, lack of information. So we decided that instead of using all the information from the simulations, we will use only part of the uh, information. So if we, if we use sufficient information to list only under one of the four criteria, what we see is that the warning time is much reduced. In other words, if we have less information, we are warned um, not as, as well in advance, as much in, in advance. Uh, we can, to some extent, compensate for this lack of information by making the assessments more frequently. Obviously, instead of every 10 years, if we make the assessments every year, we may gain um, 5 to 10 years um, of, of warning time. So that's the, um, that's the good news. Uh, with some caveats, um, it appears that, uh, that um, the, the systems that we use to identify threatened species can actually provide sufficient warning time um, for, for species that might go extinct because of climate change. But then the next question is, can we have a deeper understanding of why species would be going uh, extinct because of climate change? Can we have more mechanistic understanding of this process? So, um, remember I mentioned the, the factors that contribute to the difficulty of uh, inferring population responses to climate change. And one of them uh, is uh, related to uh, extreme weather events. Now, um, as extreme weather events become more frequent, the populations fluctuate more, and then the, that will result in higher risk of extinction. So, there is uh, so far, uh, none of the models that we have done until this year actually considered this factor exclusively. So we decided to take a look at it. And, and this is a uh, complicated issue. Well, we all know that if weather changes, some extreme events will become more frequent. For instance, if temperature um, increases, if it gets warmer, then there will be a higher frequency of uh, heat waves. And, uh, lower frequency of cold weather, right? Now, but the situation is a bit more complicated because the effect of these two extremes may not be, may not be the same. So there might be a symmetric effect on, on the demography of the species. The function may not be a symmetric function. So it's not easy to, uh, to guess what the effect would be by just looking at the change in, in, the, in temperature. Uh, and of course, it's not only temperature, there are many variables uh, that, um, that are determined by, by weather that may change in the future, and their combined effect is uh, more complex. Uh, so basically, the, uh, and, and of course, there is also an indication that 
the variance itself will increase in the future. It's not just the same distribution is shifting so that we have higher frequency of extreme events, but the distribution is shifting and also getting more variable. There's some evidence about that as well. At least for, for um, some regions of the world and some uh, precipitation related variables. So the question is what's the overall effect of this change in frequency of extreme weather events on, on, on population demography? So to do that, we started with um, um, developing population models. And the second step, which is um, uh, turned out to be rather complicated, is to estimate demography as a function of weather. And then uh, once we know demography is a function of weather, we can project population dynamics using future projected values of weather, um, weather values that are projected by global climate models. So the, um, our population model in this case is based on market capture data. Um, so if, for those of you who don't know, market capture data means that a uh, number of um, animals are captured. Uh, for instance, birds are captured in these nets and they are tagged or marked or, um, uh, or uh, marked in some way. And then they are recaptured so that we can calculate things like survival and fecundity. So we said, okay, we we'll knew that there is a program in the United States called MAPS, Monitoring Avian Productivity and Survivorship, that has uh, thousands of these um, capturing stations around the country that allows us to, to use these, um, th these methods. So we develop a population model. We, um, the, the key components include survival and fecundity and the temporal variability in these rates and the dependence of these rates to density. That's important because in order to make long-term projections, you have to know something about density dependence. You cannot um, look at a snapshot of the population and, and make long-term projections. Um, so we said, okay, we'll use this, this data to uh, calculate these values. It turns out that it wasn't that easy, uh, so we had to do a new method to do that. Uh, the method is available uh, for everyone to use at this, at this website. And basically, it takes this um, market capture data. Uh, these are capture histories. One means that the animal, the, this particular individual is captured. Zero means that it's not captured. And then based on this, we uh, estimate the stage metrics, the variability, and then the dependence. Okay, so that's the first step. Now, the second step is to estimate uh, fecundity and survival as a function of weather variables. Okay? And then, once we do that, then we can um, use um, weather projections from global climate models. These global climate models actually can make weather projections for uh, 100 years. And we, when we do that, we can um, calculate fecundity as a function of time. So when we do that, what we are doing is that we are modeling not only the average fecundity in the future and how it will change because of climate change, but we are also modeling how the variability of fecundity will change in the future because of changing variability in the weather and, and extreme weather events. Um, now, so the first step is to, to fit fecundity and survival to weather functions. The problem is there are hundreds of weather variables that we can calculate. Which one are you going to fit? We cannot put all of them into our statistical model because um, there is not that uh, that much um, sample size to allow, allow that. So what we did is that we took uh, 18 total weather variables that are most relevant to the uh, biology of the species that we are modeling, which is called like a chickadee. These are seven temperature related variables and 11 precipitation related variables. And then we decided that we can put only two variables at the time in the model because of sample size limitations. So what we did is that we selected one temperature related and one precipitation related variable. So we have a total of 77 combinations of weather variables. So we tested all of these, and then we looked at which fits the, the data better. And here is an example, for instance. This is fecundity as a function of a precipitation variable, which is the total precipitation in May, a temperature variable, which is the standard deviation of temperature in April, and population density. 
So uh, some interesting things. So this is fecundity in this axis. This is precipitation in May, and this is standard deviation of temperature. So you can see that the um, the, the effect of precipitation changes. Sorry, the effect of temperature changes as a function of total precipitation. If precipitation is low. Sorry, if precipitation is high. There is a more pronounced effect. And well, since these are you know, three variables determining a fourth variable, it's a four-dimensional thing that I cannot really show you. So what I'm showing is um, three dimensions at a time. So um, and this is the, uh, the uh, example of a survival model. It uses uh, the same precipitation variable, another di a different temperature variable, and again population density. And here the functions are different. The effect of density is, for instance, more pronounced in uh, lower um, uh, values of precipitation as opposed to higher values, and there is curved effect uh, uh, dependence on, on temperature. So basically, we fit these these um, these functions. But as I said, there are 77 of these, so uh, we fit all of them, and, and we took the top best fit models, and these are the models that have a um, that ARC of less than 2, which means that these models are pretty much equivalent. We cannot really distinguish between them in terms of how well they fit the observed. Sorry. Uh, how well they fit the observed data. Right? So we have to use all of them. So uh, basically we have 5 of these wave, uh, models and 3 of these, so we have 15 different uh, weather, weather uh, models, and then on top of that we have different uh, global circulation models that make the projections for the future. So we have about 100 different models that we are running, and we put that in um, in a metapopulation model. This is the uh, grid-based spatial structure of the metapopulation model in, the, in, in North America. Um, that has uh, survival and fecundity, as I explained, is a function of weather and density, and carrying capacity is a function of climate and land cover. Uh, and then we run this, uh, we run 100 replicates, and then uh, we look at various results. Now, I'm only going to show one result, and that result is based on expected minimum abundance. So I have to explain what that means. So we have these replicates, right? So for each replicate, we look at the minimum value. So for this replicate, the minimum value is here. So for another replicate, the minimum value might be here. And then we take the average of these minimum values. And why do we do that? Because it's a very interesting um, type of um, output. Um, as the population declines, expected minimum abundance declines because the minimum becomes become lower, right? But it also declines if the population gets more variable. Because if, if it gets more variable, again, the minimum will be closer to zero, even if the maxima are also higher. And when we take the average of the minima, um, we will also get a, a, a value that is uh, small. So here are the results. Um, so this is a bit complicated, but let me explain. So as I said, we have five survival models, three fecundity models, and a bunch of um, global circulation models, uh, global climate models, right? So what we see is that uh, different global climate models make slightly different predictions in terms of the demography of the species, and we see that this red one, which happens to be this model, um, gives higher values in general than the, than the blue one, which happens to be this, to this one. But the variability is not that much. So there is some uncertainty coming because of different global climate models, but it's not that much. Um, these three um, columns are the three different fecundity models. Right? So what we see is that the, the fecundity models make some difference, that second fecundity model always gives a lower viability than the first and third. And, but the biggest difference in the is, is in the survival model. These panels are different survival models. You can see that first survival model gives much higher prediction than the second and third, and fourth and fifth year similar to the first one. Now, let me remind you again, this is an important point. These different survival and fecundity models are selected because they fit the observed demography of the species 
more or less equal to God. Whatever the correct description of the de de dependence of the democracy of the species on weather, right? Uh, but when, so so they they explain the current demography equally well, but when you project it into the future, they make very different projections. And that's that's interesting because that means that there is a lot of uncertainty, uh, uncertainty that's coming because of the fact that different weather variables will change differently in the future. Now, if you look into the details of these, um, what we see is that the models that um, give lower um, variability have variables that, uh, very variables that have to do with the number of dry days. In other words, the number of dry days will change a lot faster in the future than, let's say, the, the um, um, total precipitation in May or um, maximum five day precipitation in May. Because of that, that um, uh, future change, there is an uncertainty in, 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 in these projections. So we are just studying this research, this is just preliminary results, but what it shows us is that we can use these models to gain a deeper understanding of why species may, might be affected from um, um, extreme weather events. But in order to make projections with these, we have to be careful in how we combine all of this uncertainty. And, it, uh, as, and, and specifically, weather variables that have similar demographic influence may change very differently in the future. And because of that, we have to do some model averaging and we are working on various approaches to that, but the main approach is to um, use um, both the AIC values that I mentioned, which is the ability of the weather variables to explain the current demography, but also uh, the skill of the global circulation model in predicting the current weather, so that we can have a, a better weighing of the different results of the, of the model. Uh, okay, so that's uh, promising, cautiously optimistic about um, our ability to gain a better understanding about causes of extinctions with respect to, um, especially in terms of the effect of extreme weather events. But what can we do to predict and understand the extinctions is different from what we can do to prevent extinctions. So I'll end with a couple of examples of, um, of projects that we did in which the, uh, we looked at the plans for the conservation of the species and how the um, new threats that we see change, change these plans. Uh, so the first example is uh, Iberian lynx, which is a, um, a cat species that is the most threatened uh, uh, carnivore in Europe, one of the most threatened mammals in the world, actually. It lives in, in these small um, um, patches. And, um, and there's a, um, obviously because it's such a threatened species, there's a multi-million dollar conservation plan that is in effect for the species that involves translocating individuals from here to other areas where it can survive. Now, what we looked at is the effect of climate change. So the, the, this translocation plan was developed without considering the effects of climate change, and we said, okay, what happens if we include climate change into this equation? Uh, now, uh, I won't go into the details of how exactly we did, but basically we have a model of the Iberian lens as a function of climate and land cover, the climate and, and climate is changing through time, but also as a function of its main prey, which is the European rabbit, and the European rabbit is also affected by climate and land cover, and there are also diseases that affect these, both of these prey and predator species. So we have this model, and then we, we, we run it, and then we look at the effects of the, the conservation plan that's in effect, and also an alternative conservation plan. So what we found is that what you see here is the abundance of the lakes in the future. Um, and the blue line is what happens if there is no conservation. And basically, it will go extinct. And what that's already known, people know that if nothing is done, the species will go extinct. So there is this uh, uh, very uh, comprehensive uh, plan for uh, recovery of the species. Now, when we model that plan that's in effect, what we found is that the, uh, there will be a slight recovery, but the final population size will not be that different from the current population size uh, of the 
species because this plant does not take into account climate change. And then we do an a, um, alternative scenario of, uh, of translocations that takes into account climate change. And what, is, what we show is that that will result in a much stronger recovery of the species. So basically we can use these kind of spatially explicit models to uh, look at the effects of um, threats such as climate change as well as uh, look at the uh, effic efficacy of conservation actions. Um, second example is, is another uh, carnivore species. This one is from the United States. It's a black-footed ferret. It's a famous species. Uh, it's also very, very threatened. And it has been recovering recently, but uh, uh, and this is the area that it lives in, this area. And these, all these dots are prairie dog colonies. Now, prairie dog is the primary trade species of the fair. Okay? Basically, it feeds only on, on, on these colonies of, of prairie dogs. As I said, the species has been recovering, has been recovering, but recently a new threat appeared uh, in this area, and that's the plague. Plague, uh, as you know, the, the, the bacterium that causes the black that humans for, for centuries basically the same, the same disease, but when it affects um, prairie dogs, what happens is that whole colonies die, and then the resulting um, decline in the prey abundance causes a decline in the, in the um, um, prairie population. Now, again, as in the case of lynx, there is a conservation plan for the species that, uh, that uh, allocates large areas for the conservation of the species. Now what we found is that because of this new threat of plague, the area, the size of the area that's allocated is, is not sufficient anymore. And uh, so we developed this model, there's a prey model and that's linked to a predator model uh, with this equation, which basically says that the population size of the prey uh, determines the gene capacity of the predator. And we added this disease model to add to look at the um, effect of disease on on the, on the trade population. And then we, we run this model and, and get results. And what we found is um, that at some combination of these spatial structure of the, of the trade population, there are these large oscillations. And because of these large oscillations, the uh, ferret has high risk of going extinct. So the extinction risk of the ferret is, is this um, gradation of gray. And you see that whenever the prey population is oscillatory, the uh, uh, black footed ferret has a high risk of extinction. And it has a low risk of extinction only when the, uh, the landscape that's allocated is much larger. And the reason is a bit complicated, but basically it has to do with the fact that in large landscapes, the, uh, the effect of the play is not as synchronized. Basically, uh, the plague may start here and may move here, and by the time it gets here, some of the trade of populations here may recover, and as a result, there is not total sinking of the death of the trade of populations that allows the trade population, which covers a much larger area, to, to persist. So basically, what we show is that the area that was considered suitable size before, which was around 25, 30 square kilometers, um, so, sorry, 30 by 30 kilometers is no longer sufficient. That that at, at that size of, of landscape that's allocated to trade dog populations, the ferrets will go extinct if if um, uh, plague arrives in that area. So, in conclusion, I told you a bunch of different stories that are all related to um, species extinctions. And the, the first one was about prediction. And um, the, the story there, the conclusion there, is that the species extinction is especially due to climate change, are quite high, so that's the bad news. But the slightly good news is that they are predictable. In other words, our methods can actually identify those species, and if we have sufficient information, we can identify um, the species that will go extinct uh, ahead of time with sufficient warning time. Um, Second, I, I, um, managed, I, I talked about our very recent research about uh, modeling the effects of uh, extreme weather events. 
And what we show is that uh, modeling demography as a function of weather um, allows us a better and a more mechanistic understanding of the effect of extreme weather events on, on population dynamics. And uh, finally, uh, I show two examples of um, spatial structure predictability models that allow a, a realistic um, representation of the spatial dynamics of these species that allow um, more uh, realistic recovery planning that takes into account emerging threats such as climate change in the case of lynx and infectious diseases in the case of the ferret. In both cases, these new threats uh, mean that the old conservation plants that were in place are no longer sufficient and these new threats must be taken into account in order to uh, conserve these species. Uh, before I finish, I want to acknowledge uh, members of my lab, my uh, numerous collaborators and my farming sources. Thank you very much.